<laughs> okay, so, uh, what's that? Yeah, you, exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so last, um, last class period we were talking about um, the exon junction complex. Um, this is actually a figure from the end of one of the papers that's posted up about this. Um, uh, the sort of basic message, sort of like the, the, the first thing to remember about it is that after an intron is spliced out, um, the, uh, the small nuclear ribonucleoproteins that do the business of splicing most of the time, there are exceptions that your book talks about a little bit that you don't need to know about for this class, um, where there are self-splicing introns and so on. But anyway, after for normal splicing, the small nuclear ribonucleoproteins do the business of splicing out the intron, um, but then there are some proteins that hang out at the junction, at the connection point between the two remaining exons. Um, and... Um, and so uh, last time we talked about um, uh, EIF, uh, uh, EIF um, A3 and it's and started talking a little bit about just like how we know it's an exon junction complex protein. We're going to go back through that today um, and then also talk about um, uh, something uh, that seems somewhat unrelated, but actually it turns out to be very closely linked to um, the function of the exon junction complex, um, which is nonsense mediated decay. Um, and if you remember, a nonsense mutation is a premature stop codon or premature termination codon. So um, nonsense mutation um, is a mutation, for example, where um, say a CAA gets converted into a UAA, um, and so that's going to lead to a premature termination codon, or premature, what we've been calling stop codons, um, and so you'll see PTC up there, that's premature termination codon. Um, so, so last time I talked about how um, some of the early evidence that the exon junction complex is important for the way messenger RNAs get processed and, uh, and sort of transported around in the cells is that if you take, um, if you insert into the nucleus of eukaryotic cells either um, a genetic code that could codes for a, the final mRNA as if it's already been spliced, um, or one that has the entire gene including the intron so that the cellular machinery can, can detect the introns by the sequences that we've sort of alluded to a little bit. Um, you don't need to memorize those sequences, but you should know they're there. Um, so the sequences um, let, the, let the small nuclear ribonucleoproteins recognize that there's an intron there, and they splice it out. Um, Based on everything that you learned in the unit one, you should think, okay, well, at, the end, at that, that's sort of the end of it, and then those two things should be identical. The mRNA that just didn't have the intron to begin with versus as compared to the mRNA that had the intron and then it got cut out. Um, but that turns out to be not quite right. Um, and, uh, and this uh, study here demonstrated that um, when you let the, when you leave the intron in so that the, cell, the cellular machinery in the nucleus has to splice it out, then that spliced mRNA um, is much, much more efficient at getting out of the nucleus than the um, identical sequence mRNA that never went spliced, that never got spliced. Um, and so this, this um, uh, work sort of builds on and also uh, has been since built on to um, establish for us that there are there's a collection of proteins called the exon junction complex that hangs out at the junction between the exons, and it has a variety of different functions, one of which is getting the, um, the um, mRNA out of the nucleus. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so before we get back into the paper that I'd begun talking about toward the end of class last time, I wanted to introduce the idea of nonsense-mediated decay. Um, there's actually quite a lot on this slide and quite a lot to potentially unpack on this slide. Um, one thing, so this is a particular gene, um, uh, uh, a particular transcript called ATF4. And this, um, e even though for this class you can sort of forget about it after we get through this slide, I, I will sort of mention it because it turns out to be quite important in a lot of ways. Um, many... Um, Many, actually, let's take that back. 
it's worth knowing about multiple open reading frames because the, 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 the last night the, the other group talked about it. So um, it turns out that many um, mRNAs violate the rule that I told you in unit one, which is that we just find the first AUG and translate from there. In fact, many messenger RNAs do have multiple what are called open reading frames. Um, and so um, an open reading frame is essentially anything in the mRNA, any sequence in a messenger RNA um, that starts with a start codon um, and can have, and these things can have variable length. Um, if you really want to get deep into multiple open reading frames, then um, I encourage you to, uh, to um, uh, talk with Dr. McManus and take, um, and take uh, some of the um, advanced courses. Um, and, and also, the, the Dr. McManus doesn't teach us, it's Dr. Wolf who teaches, but the uh, molecular biology of eukaryotes um, uh, class um, uh, goes into a lot of detail about what goes on with this. Um, there are some interesting things that aren't even shown here, and this is sort of, again, a little bit beyond what you need to know um, uh, for the class, for this class, but there's some interesting things where um, both for sort of normal open reading frames that code for a protein. So the, the proper protein coding region is actually the second AUG in this, M, in this mRNA. Um, so the main open reading frame uh, and the, and the um, what, what's called, um, sometimes you have what's called an upstream, which is really just a way of saying five prime end um, open reading frame. Um, and so these are called UORFs. Um, that's uh, if anyone remembers from Dr. McManus's lecture, uh, uh, the first uh, first day of orientation, he talked a little bit about this. Um, these these upstream open reading frames can regulate uh, can can regulate how the the proper sort of protein coding region of the mRNA gets gets translated. Um, and in both the upstream open reading frames and occasionally in the proper sort of protein coding reading frames, um, you don't always have AUGs as the start codon. The book goes into that a little bit. For this class, the only thing to remember that's beyond what you already knew at the end of unit one is just that there are cases where there are multiple open reading frames in uh, multiple, multiple regions. Sometimes they can actually code for multiple full proteins in a eukaryotic mRNA. Other times there are regions that code, uh, that, that just, um, like he's illustrated here, have an AUG and then, a, cup, and then a, a couple codons later, you get a termination codon or a stop codon. Um, and so it codes for essentially a useless protein. Um, but, um, <clears throat> um, but, uh, if, um, uh, but, but, but those, those, those upstream open reading frames can regulate um, a lot about the way that the trans, uh, the trans, the, 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 the mRNA f gets translated in future. Um, and in particular, one of the things that's been noticed is that, um, uh, so if we sort of ignore, ignore the open reading frame, which is, um, it's interesting to have, uh, sorry, ignore, ignore the sort of upstream open reading frame for a minute and just sort of focus in on um, from this AUG here onward, and then from this AUG here onward. Um, so for that, uh, it turns out that if, um, if you have one of these premature termination codons in a protein, in, in an mRNA sequence, that um, the mRNA, one ribosome will come along, start to transcribe it, stop, and then after that first ribosome finishes transcribing the sort of like short truncated peptide that's not a full length protein, then um, other enzymes in the cell will detect and recognize that this mRNA doesn't code for a proper full protein and chop it up and degrade it away. Which is what's um, which is what's um, illustrated here, and we can actually engineer things 
These are, this is a way we can disrupt genes as well. If we engineer into a gene a premature stop codon, um, even in an, a different open reading frame than the normal one, um, if we, can, we can increase the rate of this so-called nonsense-mediated decay. So, Um, is, when, is when you have these early stop codons, and then, and then after that first ribosome tries to translate it, um, a, a, a short peptide comes off, then, then um, other proteins recognize this mRNA isn't coding for a protein very well and break it apart, um, probably to conserve energy so we don't have a whole bunch of ribosomes keep trying to make a, make a protein off of this mRNA that for whatever reason isn't giving us useful protein. Um, and so, and so, what you, so we can engineer early stop codons into genes and get the and, and to then have the cell sort of uh, um, degrade away the mRNA, um, uh, even if we engineer those premature stop codons in a different reading frame than the normal reading frame of the of the protein of the mRNA. Um, but if we leave the mRNA alone, then um, then. If our, if our ribosome finds this AUG and starts here like it's sort of supposed to and ends up at the stop codon, then um, at that point, that mRNA will not be destroyed and instead another ribosome will come and start translating and making another copy of the protein. And a single mRNA can have 20, 50 ribosomes attached to it at any point in time, um, and over the lifespan of the mRNA, it might make 500 copies of a protein, because it's just like a sort of factory line where the uh, ribosomes keep marching along the mRNA translating it. So once, once the cell has determined that this mRNA does code for a proper protein, it doesn't have an early stop code on it, in it then we keep making protein off of that mRNA until, until the mRNA sort of naturally degrades and they have a sort of time constant of a uh, few, depending a little bit on what else is bound to it, an um, uh, uh, hour or something like that, uh, time, uh, uh, half-life um, for, for the mRNA sticking around. Um, right. So the sort of like core message of this is that if there's a premature stop codon, then the mRNA gets destroyed right away. If there's not a premature stop codon, then the mRNA sticks around and the protein and, and we make a whole bunch of proteins off of this one mRNA. Okay, so there's sort of a lot, a lot that I just kind of went over with that. Um, uh, before we sort of loop back to the exon junction complex um, and, and sort of like how, what the heck splicing in the nucleus has to do with nonsense mediated decay outside of the nucleus, um, what questions do people have about all of this stuff so far? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So if we ignore this sort of like really short reading frame here that doesn't uh, have much effect on the protein uh, or on the mRNA, um, that's right. It doesn't matter what frame. So, um, so there's sort of uh, if we have if we ignore that for a second, we've got our five prime end. Here's our AUG. Here's our sort of uh, normal stop codon. And so this is the part that's going to get translated here. Um, there are essentially two ways that I could mess this process up and, and get this mRNA degraded. Um, so option number one, um, or option A, uh, is to leave everything else alone but insert um, a premature stop code on here, premature termination code on here. Um, that could be converting a CAA to a UAA, for example, or CAG to a UAG or whatever. Um, so instead of making a glutamine, it just stops. Um, or I think, I think it's glutamine. Anyway, um, option number two would be to um, put, so here's our normal AUG and our normal termination code on. And then if I insert in here something like an AUG here that's actually in a different frame from this one, then um, it's sort of a little hard to imagine. But um, uh, so if there's a CAUAAA in this frame, then that's not going to be read as a stop codon. 
But if this AUG is in a different frame from this one, then that same CAU AAA might get read here as a UAA and a stop codon. And so again, I introduced, I sort of, I, I, by introducing an early start codon, I actually get the ribosomes translating out of frame in a way that makes it so that what uh, some things that wouldn't have been read as stop codons now do get read as stop codons. So yeah, so our C, our CA here is in some different frame, and then our, our other A here is in the is in a different frame from that. That's a little bit. Uh, I mean, I think I think. I, that, that's worth, that, I think that's worth sort of understanding that, 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 that you can even change the frame by introducing a different stop codon, or sorry, a different start codon. You can change the frame, and then in changing the frame, you can convert what otherwise would have been non-stop codons into stop codons. So, so yeah, let's sort of pause there. Do people kind of follow the logic for what's going on with that? Questions about that? Well, so um, so so these are so this is this is the normal gene, and then this is one mutated gene, or the pro this is the transcript that I get off the normal gene. This would be the transcript that I get off of a mutated gene where I put an early stop codon in, and then this would be a transcript that I get off of a different mutation in the gene where I change the frame by putting a start codon in a different place. So these are two different ways that I could alter the gene. Um, to, to make this happen. Um, or alternatively, this premature termination codon maybe wouldn't be an, another option as we, as we uh, get into RNA editing toward the end of class today and, and, and through into class on Tuesday. Um, if I had, um, let's say, the CAU um, that, uh, uh, does UAU? Yeah, UAU is, uh, is a stop codon. Um, so, uh, no, anyway, I, can't, no, I don't think so. Anyway, whatever it is. So um, let's change this to a CAU. Yeah, it's not going to work. Whatever. Um, so, um, uh, so another 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 option would be, let's say, somewhere over here in this frame, there's a there's another CAA, right? Like this. Um, kind of redraw this to line it up here. Um, if I did a did a deamination reaction on the C, then that would get read as a UAA here in this frame. So I could either re-engineer the gene to put in a premature stop codon or um, uh, change the uh, sort of activity of these enzymes that do RNA deamination in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus to, to make, it, make a premature stop codon get introduced that way. Actually, another way to introduce a, a, a premature start codon is again by RNA editing. So maybe over here there's some AUA that normally doesn't get read. If I deaminate that A here, then that's going to convert it to an inosine, to an I, um, and then the AUI would get read like an AUG and would be another way to introduce. So, so, um, so you can engineer premature stop code. You can either engineer it at the genomic level by, by altering the genes, or you can engineer it by changing the way the RNA gets processed. That's kind of a lot in here. So, what questions do people have? It looks like, yeah, sure. What if the ribosome doesn't find that AOG? Um, yeah. So, we'll, we'll again, sort of ignoring some complexity here. We'll say that it does. It will. If we put it there, it will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's. Um, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll come back and discuss this a little bit more uh, in, a, in a little bit when we get to, to, to the nonsense media decay. Um, so um, one other thing that actually um, I wanted to, to point out and, and correct from, from last class period um, is that, um, so, so we're going to, uh, in, in talking about, um, uh, in talking about the exon junction complex, um, it actually participates in splicing, which is maybe not a huge surprise since that's when it gets incorporated, and sort of not incorporated, but that's when it gets associated with the mRNA. Um, it also um, uh, uh, has some, some functions that involve um, uh, where the RNA gets to in the cell sometimes. Uh, there was a question on the exam about um, uh, potentially RNAs might only go to a certain part of the cell, maybe like the branches of a cardiac muscle cell or something like that. Um, even just getting the mRNA out of the nucleus requires the exon junction complex. Um, and in addition, to, uh, uh, in addition to that, as we'll talk about in a little bit, it's involved in nonsense-mediated decay. 
In addition to all of that, some of the exon junction complex proteins, especially at that first junction between exon 1 and exon 2, are even involved in getting the small subunit of the ribosome to the, the mRNA in the first place. And um, EIF a3, um, I, 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 uh, I had forgotten the name before we started talking yesterday, uh, Tuesday, but um, it's, it's a eukaryotic initiation factor. So it's actually first named as an initiation factor that was involved in helping get the small subunit to the mRNA in the first place. Um, uh, and we now, and it turns out now that it has all of these different functions and seems to be this core protein in the exon junction complex that mediates a variety of different functions in, in the exon junction complex. Um, the two functions of the exon junction complex to focus on, to, to sort of focus most of your attention on, is RNA export that we talked about last time and the nonsense mediated decay, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, questions about that? Okay, um, so like um, uh, like we uh, uh, so 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 we began talking about this last time. Um, there are sort of a few different. Uh, you can either do um, immunoprecipitation where you target um, where you have antibodies that target EIF four uh, EIF four A three directly, um, or antibodies where you um, uh, where you target uh, EIF four. Um, uh, th that's been the fusion protein where it's been fused to um, glutathione S transferase, which is um, which is itself an enzyme um, that's useful because there are well-established antibodies, and also because it binds glutathione, you can have beads coated with this pro this this small molecule called glutathione um, that that will that it will stick to as well. Um, but the the sort of um, um, in this figure, what they are doing is they are looking at. Um, uh, they're doing a they're doing a, um, a, a, um, a northern blot looking at mRNA levels um, in the condition where they have either the pre RNA pre mRNA and let the cell do the splicing or what they should have called the um, consistent with the other paper the de the deleted intron mRNA. Here they just say mRNA by itself, but they really mean that they've deleted the intron from it. So they've got a pre-spliced version of it. And so when you, you, um, uh, you immunoprecipitate the mRNA, um, or sorry, you immunoprecipitate um, EIF for A3, what you find is that the um, mRNA um, uh, uh, comes down with it. Um, but uh, if, 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 you, if you put in the pre-mRNA, then the final mRNA comes down with it. Um, but if you put in the, um, the, the pre-spliced mRNA and don't let EIF4 bind to it, don't let the exon junction complex bind to it, then nothing comes down out of your immunoprecipitation. Um, and this diagram here just says like where 24 nucleotides before the exon, that's sort of where the probes that they're using in their, in their, in their blot is targeting. Um, but the point being that really, that as, as the slide says, EIF4A3 binds the mRNA directly. I think I should have probably add it on there as long as, we, as long as there was an intron that got spliced out, which is what the sort of left side versus right side is about. Yeah, sure. So, so these are protein bands that we're looking at? These are um, RNA, bands. RNA bands. No, no, you know what? Yeah. No, this is actually, I'm sorry, these are protein bands, and they're, they're, they're actually they're doing a sort of reverse IP. It shouldn't, yeah, this, they shouldn't call it an IP because it's not immunoprecipitation because they're not using antibodies. They're actually using DNA probes to pull out the mRNA and then seeing what proteins come along for the ride. And so EIF4 protein comes along for the ride when they use a DNA probe to pull out the, the mRNA. Um, this is a series of, um, uh, of essentially immunoprecipitations. They're using this GST fusion uh, construct. Um, uh, and the, the point is that there are other sort of well-known proteins in the exon junction complex. If you forget their names, I, it doesn't matter to me. Um, Y14 and MAGO. Um, and, um, and so Y14 and MAGO are both present in their input. Um, if they 
put Y14 and Mago in a test tube with just GST, just the, just the second half of the fusion protein, then the GST itself doesn't really bind to that. And then they pull, they pull down what sticks to the GST. The GST isn't directly sticking to these. But if we have a fusion protein that has EIF uh, uh, 4A3 fused to glutathione S transferase, then Y14 and MAGO do associate with that. Um, and in addition to that, if we have, uh, uh, G this is just showing that MAGO associates directly with Y14 as well um, when we do a sort of related experiment with, um, with GST uh, fused to MAGO. Um, it pulls, it sticks to Y14. Um, but the main, the main sort of comparison to, to be looking at here is that First of all, G, like with, with, whenever you're doing fusion proteins, you always have to worry about is the fusion protein screwing something up about my, my, um, my, uh, the protein that I'm interested in. We've talked about that already in terms of um, maybe screwing up where the protein ends up in the cell when you attach this big second protein on as this giant two proteins strung together sort of situation. Um, but in addition to that, if you're doing an immunoprecipitation with a fusion protein, you want to make sure that the result that you're seeing is not because the other half, the added fusion protein, sticks to your proteins of interest, but that the, thing that you, the, the one protein that you care about sticks to the other proteins that you care about. And so the control here is to just make sure that the GST part of our fusion protein isn't sticking to these, these other two, y, Y14 and MAGO. Um, but then the fusion protein, with has, which has our, pro, our EIF4A3 uh, that we care about, fused to GFT, uh, GST, that does stick to these. So that's sort of the main comparison here. Um, and then the conclusion being, like it says here on the slide, EIF4A3 binds to um, some of the known other proteins that are involved in the exon junction complex. Yeah. Questions about that? Yeah, sure. Why do the GST level last I'm not really sure what that adds to this, is, except I think... Yeah, I mean, so the, those two proteins are known to bind to each other, and I guess maybe, I mean, so, 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 so one way to think about it is to think about it as a positive control, as something where we sort of know all in advance that these two should stick to each other. Um, so, um, and positive controls are often valuable because, um, for example, uh, I guess I would say in this case, it's not really absolutely necessary because since our experiment itself worked as we expected, the positive control doesn't give us that much more information. Um, but a positive control can be quite informative, and they might have included this because maybe they don't know in advance maybe whether or not these two are going to stick to each other, for example. And so the positive control gives us, we know that, the ex, that in, under these conditions, exon junction complex proteins are sticking together. And so, because this, and so this, it may, and so if we didn't, if we hadn't yet done this, and we just do this, then we're like, okay, well, in our lab, under the conditions that we're doing this, the two known exon junction complex proteins that should be sticking together are in fact sticking together. Um, and so that would mean then that if the if we didn't see Y Y14 and MAGO attached to EIF A43 EIF 4A3, um, if we didn't see them stuck together stuck here, then that, would, then that wouldn't be because our salt concentrations were too high and no proteins were sticking to any other proteins or something like that, but that really we've got conditions right where the exon junction complex can form. And then, and then it makes it so that if we f see a negative result here with no bands here, we know that that's really because those proteins aren't associating together. So probably when they set up the experiment, they included the positive control so that Either way, whether they see bands or not, they could properly interpret them. Um, but since they're seeing the bands, the, po the value of the positive control becomes a little bit less critical, I think. Yeah, did you want to yeah, add so something? Does this mean that for like, the previous slide, when they bind and talk mRNA, that lack of binding is supportive of it not being, of there not being an exon junction complex, as because this can bind to the exon junction complex? That's a good point. Yeah, um, I think I, I I think that 
I think that that's a reasonable hypothesis to make. Um, I think that it would be an open question still whether other. I, I think I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to like you know bet my career or whatever on on the on um, why on on why fourteen and Mago not binding to the mRNAs when we uh, uh, um, when they don't splice. Um, uh, and we actually, it's pretty likely considering everything else you know about the exon junction complex. Um, but just based on these data presented here alone, um, I would want to actually do the experiment where you look to make sure why uh, Y14 and oh, Mago aren't binding. I was talking binding. specifically about uh, uh, initiation factor four. Oh yeah, well yeah, yeah. So I think in that. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So we have a positive result here compared to a negative result here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, Correct. Yeah. Under the conditions here. Um, so, for example, yeah. So another way this could turn out is like, there's no band here. Maybe that means that we're totally that 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 we're sort of on the wrong path. And EIF A4 uh, EIF uh, uh, 4A3 doesn't bind to the exon junction complex at all. Alternatively, if we just see nothing, 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 that could just mean that, again, like salt concentrations are too high or something else is going on where um, um, the exon junction complex just isn't forming properly. And so, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point that, 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 um, that you always want to have, uh, I mean, there, there, there are vari there are, there's not just one control usually. There's also, there's like a variety of different controls. Like we want to make sure that this stuff is in our input. We wanna, so, you know, there's a variety of different controls that you need to do in these experiments. Um, but, um, but ultimately sort of the, often the critical comparison comes down to a situation where something isn't binding to, the, to, to something else compared to another situation that's virtually identical with one small change and they do bind or vice versa. And so in that case, then you can attribute the binding or not to that difference. Um, whereas if you see like no binding anywhere, then it's hard to know whether it's an artifact of something about the experimental protocol that you're doing. Or you see everything binding everywhere, then again, it could be like the salt concentrations are too low and things are, st everything is too sticky. I don't know, there's a lot of, so, so you want to you wanna see, yeah. So, so seeing the specificity is very important in these kinds of experiments. Yeah, does that make sense? That's a bit, Potentially a useful sort of exam question too to think about as you're sort of thinking about this is you know like like well, um, uh, uh, what what would you want to compare this against and why would that be a useful comparison kind of thing uh, is sort of like you know. So we want to compare it against a situation where we don't see it, and what would be the proper situation where you don't expect to see it, like the you know the 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 the, the GST, the the thing that we're fusing to EIF alone, um, or um, or some situation where there's no splicing, or in a different context, um, uh, you know, uh, comparing the the chromatin immunoprecipitation, uh, like they did in the la in the paper from last night, um, under conditions where ORF three was and wasn't deleted. Um, is is sort of um, valuable comparison for um, for seeing that, but but um, but yeah, it's it's only, it's you know you always need you always need to be comparing things to make meaningful conclusions. Yeah, questions about that. Okay, so um, so what they've got now here is um, there's. Uh, this um, this protein called um, TCR beta, or this this transcript called TCR beta, um, and in this transcript, um, this is now in in um, uh, in uh, in living cells, not just like mixing together things in a test tube to see what sticks to what. Um, in living cells, we've got some TCR beta that we've put into these cells, and this TCR beta is engineered to have a premature stop codon. So. Um, and they don't, I, I, I don't think they specify which of option A or B from over there they use, but it kind of doesn't matter. Um, one way or another, this, this, this has a premature stop codon. So if everything's working right in the cell, then this should be, after it's transcribed, be quickly degraded. Um, uh, actually, um, there's, oh, sorry, there's, there's two conditions. So there's TCR beta. And then it's going to cut off a little bit. I'm sorry. This is PTC plus premature stop codon plus, and then in parentheses siRNA, um, which so PTC plus. That's with 
the premature stop codon, premature termination codon in the TCR beta. Um, and then the other thing is um, siRNA. Um, and so this is small interfering RNAs. And these small interfering RNAs, like we talked about last time, via the risk complex and the sort of they form double-stranded RNAs and the risk complex peels them apart and so on and looks and goes and looks then for uh, um, uh, messenger RNAs that complement it. These small interfering RNAs are going to knock down, which just means dramatically reduce expression of their particular target protein. And in this case, the target proteins for these siRNAs are the one that they care about, EAIF uh, A, or 4A3, um, and then um, uh, some other um, other um, initiation factors. So I mentioned before that, um, that EIF, even though now we know that EIF 4A3 is part of the exon junction complex, one of its many roles is to help with initiation. Um, and they so, they, so for their control, what they're doing is, um, is altering um, uh, uh, other initiation factors, um, and then there's actually also one um, that is a termination factor. This uh, this E uh, this E T. Um, that's uh, that's one of those. Um, or sorry, no, that's the um, that, sorry that's the, the elongation factor. Um. So they're knocking down these varying things. Oh, there's one other control, actually, um, which is this EIF 4A3 INV, which stands for inverted, which essentially means we have the same all of the same a, all of the same a, u, g, and c's, but everything runs three prime to five prime, so it doesn't complement the mRNA for EIF. Um, so inverted, so it's so it's uh, not going to complement. Um, and this is uh, um, the mRNA for um, the EIF that we care about. And this is a common thing, actually, that people use in um, RNA interference experiments is to make is ways to sort of make sure that that whatever they're seeing is specific to um, the protein that they the, the mRNA that they think they're knocking down. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, I missed this. What is, what is PTC and TCR data? PTC is premature termination codon. Okay. Yes. So so. Um, over here, this left side, all the TCR, uh, all the TCR beta has a premature stop codon, and if everything's working right in the cell, it should get destroyed via the non nonsense mediated decay. Over here, there's no premature stop codon, and so it shouldn't be degraded. And so over here, we're expecting to see, um, uh, we're expecting to see pretty much normal levels. When we mess with um, some of these factors that are involved in termination. Uh, so this is this is looking at um, uh, yeah this is this is looking at uh, right so 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 actually what what I wish they'd done that they didn't um, is do um, the for, the forward version of the elongation factors because that should stop all protein production um, and so I don't actually quite know why they have yeah, the other T inverse um, uh, anyway. Um, uh, I, they should, they, they, one thing that's lacking over here is, 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 something, is something that, that really should not prevent, prevent uh, translation, because we're looking for protein, right? This is a Western plot. So we're looking for, for, for uh, TCR beta protein, and over here, they're actually sort of missing having a, a, a 
negative control or a, a situation where they know that they're going to get no, uh, no, uh, no TCR beta. But you know, we'll sort of roll, roll with the paper nonetheless. Um, they also look at um, um, some of the, the ribosomal RNA subunits just to make sure that the ribosomal RNA isn't getting screwed up by any of this. OK. Um, and so anyway, so when, when things are working right, everything over here with the premature termination codon should go through nonsense-mediated decay. Whereas everything over here without the premature termination codon should not undergo nonsense mediated decay, which is when you look at it, mostly what's working, right? Um, one sort of side note: when you get when you knock down EIF four A three, one of the th effects that that has, like we talked about last time, is it makes it less efficient for the mRNA to get out of the nucleus. So you get some translation, but you'll notice that this band is a lot thinner than some of these others because we're not getting the mRNA out of the nucleus properly. But that's not really quite the main point um, of this. Actually, before I get to the, the sort of main point, so is everyone clear on the fact that, like, basically sort of ignoring this one for a second, which is the one that's sort of the most interesting, over here, premature termination codon, we get nonsense mediated decay. Over here, no premature termination codon, we make our protein. Feeling good about that? OK. OK. Actually, I said, I said that wrong before. We're not looking at protein. We're looking at mRNA levels. So, so, um, so yeah, so sorry. So over here, no, we, we, get, um, we get the mRNA survives. So we still see mRNA here. Um, and, over, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then over here, we don't. Um, so the mRNA gets, uh, gets destroyed. OK. So. So. The mRNA survives when there's a premature stop codon. The mRNA. Oh yeah. This actually. Oh, so actually, yeah. So this is. So, so this is. There's an. Up, there's. This is actually. I do know which version of it they're doing. Um, there's. There's two open reading frames. One with a premature stop codon. Another without. And the mRNA gets destroyed. And so therefore we don't get protein. Is what's going on with this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry. Okay. All right. So. So. Okay. So. We've got our mRNA here. Here's where the exon was, where the junction between the exon junction was. So this is now out of the nucleus. We've spliced together our mRNA. And so we've got this whole exon junction complex, EIF um, uh, for A3 and a half dozen other proteins all hanging out right here at this exon junction complex. Here's our AUG. Here's our regular termination codon. So what happens, um, and this is partially based on this and then also um, other work that has been done around the same time as this and follow-up work and so on. Um, what we now understand about the mechanism for nonsense mediated decay is that do you have another color? So a ribosome starts out over here, and then the ribosome is just going to start walking this way along the mRNA. As it, and it gets to the start codon, it starts. When it gets to the stop codon, it stops. But the ribosome is this big fat protein, and it's, and it's walking along, and it needs to like be in contact with the mRNA. And so what happens is when the ribosome gets to this exon junction complex, it kind of like shoves the exon junction complex away from the mRNA. Um, and so what that means is that after our first ribosome, has translated the protein, then the exon junction complex has been like a bulldozer shoving aside a whole pile of dirt has been, um, has been uh, uh, pushed away. And it's gone. It's no longer, so no longer on the mRNA. And in fact, 
the, I sort of waved my hands and didn't explain things. And some, some of this is still not fully understood. But the way, what we, we, what, what we do know is that the way that cells and the enzymes in cells can tell whether an mRNA has a full length protein that it makes or whether it's got a premature stop code on is because mRNAs with full length proteins, the first time a ribosome goes by, those exon junction complex proteins are gone. And so if we compare this to, say, over here, some situation where there's a premature stop codon, or maybe even a premature AUG, and then a, and then a premature stop codon like here, something like that, which is more like what they did here. So if the first ribosome finishes, and the exon junction complex is still there, then that means that the, the ribosome stopped before it worked its way across the whole mRNA. And so, and so then other enzymes in the cell will stick to the mRNA at the, they'll, they'll attach to the exon junction complex and say, wait a minute, you're still here. I mean, don't say, wait a minute, you're still here. But, so think of them saying, wait a minute, you're still here. You shouldn't be here. There was already a ribosome. Um, and so, and so you must, this must be a useless mRNA. Let's destroy this mRNA, break it in half, and then once, and as we talked about with RNA, uh, RNA interference and, and, uh, uh, and uh, risk complex and so on, once you break an RNA in half, one side doesn't have a five prime cap, the other side doesn't have a three prime tail, and so it quickly gets completely degraded away into nothing, into just individual nucleotides. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so that's, that's been quite a lot of stuff to work through. Um, sort of take a, take a few minutes to, to, to get together with your groups and a few questions to, sort of, to think about um, and, uh, and take notes on and so on. Um, uh, so question number one is sort of just in general, review nonsense-mediated decay, um, review and questions about that. Um, number two is to, um, to um, in particular, review e uh, exon junction complex uh, and its relationship, what I just described, to nonsense-mediated decay, how that relationship happens. And then the last thing is something that I didn't quite say yet, but we'll, uh, I kind of just got to the point of saying, which is um, uh, that first column over there in the first, um, in the first band, there, uh, in the first thing there. So why do we get translation of the main open reading frame for, um, uh, for what is it, TCR beta um, when there's this premature, uh, this premature termination codon and RNAi for E, A, E, E, I, F, for a three, so we've got so why in this one case are we still getting this? And so the mRNA looks kind of like what I've drawn here, where here's our exon junction, here's our sort of like main open reading frame, but then we've had this premature, this early start and early stop codon that we've added in that should trigger nonsense mediated decay, um, and yet we don't get nonsense mediated decay in this one specific case. So, so sort of tying together everything for why that is. So that might, that's probably going to take 10 or, 10 or 12 minutes. Um, go ahead and get together with your groups, take notes, write down your answers. And also, again, for that one too, like what questions do you have? Um, so summary and questions for all of this. Yeah. This is... No, this is protein. That's why they're using actin. Okay, it's is, Northern Watt, which is mRNA. Oh. And I'm just looking for 
Yeah, yeah so this is, is, is it? <laughs> okay, so this is, okay, so it must be acting in mRNA. That's why I got, it's acting in mRNA. Okay, that's, that's why, that's why I got confused and I thought, it's a, yeah, I, got, I was thinking like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So why, so why do we get, I guess so it would be, why do we get um, mRNA persistence, the mRNA not, not degraded? Okay, yeah, that's why, it's why I wrote, because the first time I looked at that, I saw actin, I was like, actin, it must be a loading control and protein bot, and so, yeah, and so then, yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we're looking at mRNA levels, and I guess actin, mRNA to, to compare to make sure that everything's healthy. Thank you. Okay, but still, the, 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 why, why is the mRNA not degraded away is kind of the question for that. Okay, yeah. Anyway, three things to work through. And if you have questions... Or you get stuck or something, give us a holler. Yeah, what's up? I'm sorry? What if the PTC is after the absolute Then you won't, then you won't, then, then, the, then it'll, the, then it, uh, so yeah, if you, had, if you introduced a premature stop code on after that, then it would not give you a nonsense mediated decay. Um, that's sort of complicated by the fact that most genes have, have multiple introns, and so you need to have, if you, had, if you have an early stop code on in the last exon, then you're, not, then you're going to get no nonsense mediated decay. Um, yeah. Yeah, if, if any of the exons still have, if any of the exon junctions still have this on them, then you're going to get nonsense mediated decay. But, um, yeah. 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 It's some it's some protein sequence, some mRNA sequence that um, I don't remember what it codes for. Um, it's not really important. It's an mRNA that they have a sort of normal version of and a version that has a premature stop code on. Um, you premature termination code on. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's some mRNA. It doesn't really matter what. So you could, they could have picked any mRNA in the world, and they would have gotten the same result. It's the use is because it's an mRNA that we can track. Yeah. I mean, it could have been mRNA for. Could have been the mRNA for anything that you want. It would have been the same result. Just some ran some random mRNA that codes for who knows what that does some something that the cell doesn't need. But we can it's it could be GFP, could have been anything. So 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 PDC plus I mean we have we have P T you have you have you have Yeah. Premature termination code in the mRNA for T C R beta. The, the band means that the, uh, yeah, exactly. The band means the mRNA is not degraded away. Well, in that case, we have a premature stop codon, so it's not a normal mRNA. It should have gotten degraded away, but it didn't. And so the question is, why doesn't it get degraded away? So that's because they have not yeah. premature stop code. No, no, there is a premature stop code on. This, there is, this one here, there is a premature stop code on. It should be degraded away, but because we've got RNAi for this, it's not. Talk about that with your group for a second and see what they, yeah. Maybe turn your chair around so that you can see everybody. Yeah. yeah. If there is still Thank you.
or so to keep, uh, make sure make sure you especially talk about the last point, but also if there are questions about nonsense media decay or exon junction complex relationship to nonsense media decay, be sure to put those down in the paper as well. Yep. So if we have not, so we have not, we will have not EJC. That's so, right. So it will not be, be meet Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe about a minute left to finish up. It sounds like most of the groups have mostly finished their discussions. Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, okay, so as, as the groups are finishing up, we can kind of come back together and talk about this a little bit. So, so normally, remember, at the, at the exon junction, we have uh, EIF a, uh, 4A, uh, 4A3 um, and some other stuff all sort of hanging out here. After that first translation, so, so actually here, let me draw it this way. So if we, in, normal, in the normal situation with no premature stop codon, after the first translation, the mRNA is left. Um, maybe some more ribosomes come and attach to it. Here's still our AUG. Here's our normal stop codon. Um, but here at the exon junction, the proteins have been bulldozed away. They're gone. And so the cell says, great, no, no, no EJC proteins left. This is a good mRNA. Let's keep it around. Um, if we put in an upstream reading frame and a premature termination codon, then this exon junction stays, and, um, and then we're going to get degradation, right? So with this, so let's say without the upstream open reading frame, this goes fine. Um, with the upstream open reading frame, we get degradation. Why? Because why? Why? Why do we get degradation? How does the cell know that this is a bad mRNA if we have this upstream? Or how does the cell? Why does the cell think it's a bad mRNA if we have this upstream open reading frame? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, jink. Anyway, go ahead, Brent. The exon junction complex is still there. Exon junction complex is still there. So we destroy, so we destroy the mRNA. Okay. So why then, when we when we knock down, basically eliminate uh, EIF four A three. Why does the mRNA, even with the open reading frame, so here we have with this upstream open reading frame, um, but no EIF for a three, we get no degradation, right? No degradation. That's what's shown in the band by the presence of the, of the mRNA band there. Why not? Essential for the exon junction complex. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, yeah, it's essential for the exon junction complex. What does the mRNA look like when there's? If we sort of like zoomed in and looked at the mRNA, would it, would it have stuff here? or Would it not have stuff here? See, a couple of people. Yeah, not. Yeah, the EIF four A three is critical for the exon junction complex formation, and when that when that's gone, there's nothing there, and so this we're, we're sort of tricking the cell by not having this marker. The, the EIF a43, A, yeah, A43 is what is what is what labels this mRNA as bad, and if that's not there, then there's no label on the mRNA that says that there is a premature stop code on there. So what is the difference between this one and the delta I? The delta I was ones where um, I mean, so we would we would predict that. So with the delta I, there's there's another function of the exon junction complex which is help get it out of the nucleus. And so with the delta I, they don't get out of the nucleus. But if we somehow sidestep that and manage to get it out of the nucleus, I would expect an mRNA that, that, was, that was made without intron splicing out to, to, not, to also be insensitive to nonsense-mediated decay. Because again, there's no exon junction complex there, because there was never an intron that we spliced out. And so we have trouble getting out of the nucleus if we don't have the, if we don't have the, the intron. But if we manage to get over that hurdle and got it out of the nucleus, then there would be no nonsense media decay. That would be another great question to ask on the exam, for example. Yeah. Without uh, the initiation, or the uh, EIF 4A3, can you get out of the nucleus? And does it Slowly, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it makes it significantly less efficient. And Decay happens outside of the Correct. Yeah, because it's after the first trans translation, and that is at, you have to have a, let the ribosome have a shot at it, which happens all outside the nucleus. And does that? Do you ensure that the ribosome have a shot at it because of the exon junction complex delivering it to the ribosome? Um, I think in part yes, and also the other machinery for nonsense mediated decay seems to hang out with the ribosome 
and sort of be associated with the ribosome in ways that I don't fully understand and I think are still, are still um, uh, not very well worked out. But um, you do need that first ribosome, first ribosome try before the, the nonsense mediated decay machinery even finds the mRNA. And, 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 it's, and, and the nonsense mediated decay machinery seems to be sort of associated with the ribosome so that, so that um, it doesn't even, so, so, so an mRNA that hasn't had a, a ribosome take a shot at it yet, there won't be any nonsense mediated decay machinery that comes and tries to look for exon junction complex stuff so left to attach. Yeah. So, so will there be any marker that ribosome will live if it will live? Um, sorry, say. Is there any marker that ribosome will live after they finish the Do they do they leave anything at I'm not aware of anything that the ribosome leaves attached to the mRNA. I always think of the mRNA as sort of like stripped bare after the ribosome's done, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah. So after an mRNA is processed for the first time, the exon junction complex is removed, it's not signaled for nonsense mediated decay, but it can still be used or recognized by a ribosome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, it is. So then, so after that, then dozens of ribosomes are going to just take turns making more and more. So that one mRNA makes makes 50 proteins or 100 proteins or something. But a whole bunch of, yeah, when, once that first ribosome is done, then the whole reason we keep the mRNA around is so that we can make more protein off of it. And in a single mRNA molecule can be used over and over and over and over again to make multiple proteins. Yeah. So even when there is a premature stop and a single protein of faulty shorter length is created, it's not really an issue because it's only one singular protein. Correct. It's not a way, big waste of energy because stringing together amino acids is energetically expensive. And so stringing together half a protein worth of amino acids over and over again is wasting a lot of energy. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. All right. Um, actually, so I'm going to skip past some of these slides. Are some of the slides taken? Um, uh, uh, some other slides looking at um, uh, sort of RNA interference in more detail, but we already got the overview of it. And so instead, I want to sort of transition into RNA editing um, by deamination, which is the um, uh, the the something that you did a homework assignment on that was due, I think, last week. Um, reading about this in the book. Uh, and so deamination is literally the removal of an amino group, so NH2 attached to a carbon, that's an amino group, um, an amine. Um, and so uh, in deamination reactions, what happens is that NH2 gets replaced by what's called a carbonyl, which is just a carbon, instead of, instead of, uh, instead of the NH2, we have now this carbon being double bonded to an oxygen. And there's a little bit of reorganization of some other electrons to allow that carbon to do the double bonding. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so what we've, we've done here is we have um, changed uh, the structure of this. And so this is um, a, a C, cytosine base, and then this is a uracil base. Um, and if you remember way back to the beginning of the semester, we talked about how the difference between uracil and thymine is there's a methyl group hanging off of thymine. So, um, and th so these, the, this, this side of the uracil is what's going to hydrogen bond with the, uh, with the A nucleotide. Um, over here, there's a methyl group. And one of the reasons why DNA has T's is because for DNA, we want to make sure that we don't have spontaneous deamination of our C's because that would be introducing C to U mutations all over the DNA. And in fact, actually, C to U mutations do happen somewhat frighteningly frequently in your nucleus. Um, and there are proteins looking for uracils and replacing them back with, uh, with uh, cytosine nucleotides um, to correct these sort of spontaneous deamination reactions. Um, but as you learned in the, um, in the um, uh, reading that you did, sometimes cells deaminate, not, not DNA, but deaminate RNA on purpose. Um, and deaminating RNA on purpose can serve um, a variety of different functions. Um, one function is to intentionally create a stop codon. Um, this would have to be 
after the last exon junction so that we don't get nonsense mediated decay. But if we want to create a shorter version of a protein, so, uh, we can convert a CAA, which codes for aspartate, I think, um, into a UAA, um, and, uh, and then, um, and then um, create a shorter version of a protein. And they talk about apolipoprotein B. There's, there's one gene for apolipoprotein B um, and two different proteins that get made off of it, a, a, a long version and a short version. The long version is 100 amino acids long. The short version is 48 amino acids long. And the, and the way that you make two different proteins, you know, we've talked before about making two different proteins off one gene. One way to do it is to splice together different combinations of introns. Um, in this case, we're not splicing together different combinations of introns, but in intestinal cells that want to make the short version because they don't want to completely metabolize away um, the, the lipids, but they just want to absorb, break them down a little bit to absorb them, um, we get um, uh, this spontaneous, no, sorry, this, uh, not spontaneous, this, this, um, these, these deaminases that catalyze deamination um, so that essentially every mRNA that gets made off of the apolipoprotein B gene gets deaminated at this site, and then we make this um, uh, shortened protein, which has a different function that serves a different purpose, and it's sort of intentionally a different purpose, um, or sort of, you know, valuably a different purpose, or whatever, um, in the intestinal cells, as compared to the liver cells, where the uh, mRNA is not deaminated. And therefore not, um, uh, and therefore, and therefore we get the longer protein off of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so it said that very quickly. Um, uh, it has to be after the last exon junction. So so what that tells you is that this is all one exon. Maybe there's an intron that was here, so an exon junction complex here. But if there was an exon junction complex, a second exon, a second, a second intron over here, and a second exon junction complex here, then this would go through nonsense mediated decay. So, um, so this premature stop, this, this earlier stop codon, this earlier stop codon has to come after the, the junction after wherever the intron was. So that we still bulldoze. So when we translate this, our exon junction complex was here. We still bulldoze across that and remove that exon junction. If there was a second intron out here and a second exon junction complex out here, then that would remain, and then this would get nonsense, go through nonsense. So okay. all the exon junction complex are between the stop codon and the earlier. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, great question. Um, so, so the, there, the book uses this as an example. There are a few other cases. Um, oh, actually, there's one other thing. The book sort of mentions this a little bit, but um, there, there, there's a lot of Cs in this mRNA, and only one of them gets deaminated. Um, and what happens is in the intestinal cells, in addition to the deaminase enzyme that actually catalyzes the reaction, there are what are called accessory proteins, and these are RNA-binding proteins that bind at specific sequences. And so the sequence of the RNA near this CAA is what attracts and, and causes these accessory proteins to stick. And then once they stick, that dictates which C is going to get deaminated by the deaminase enzyme. Does that make sense? OK, so um, another form of deamination reaction that happens is adenosine to inosine conversion. Um, and um, it's, again, in an adenosine, just like in, in, in a cytosine, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, an amino group. And then that amino group can be converted into this double bond, uh, C double bond to an oxygen carbonyl group. Um, and, that, um, and the inosine nucleotide is structurally very similar to a guanosine, a G nucleotide. And in fact, we'll base pair. It's a little bit sloppy in its base pairing, but it does the best base pairing with a C. So it behaves pretty much exactly like a G nucleotide here. Um, 
uh, if you back, if you go back and look at some of the wobble-based pairing stuff that we kind of went over so quickly that it, that it wasn't on the study guide and everything, you'll see that inosines are in there and they're a little bit promiscuous in their binding. But for right now, let's just sort of think of inosine as a sort of uh, effectively identical to a G nucleotide. Um, and the the um, review that I had you look at. Um, uh, illustrated um, uh, a variety of different things that can happen when you um, effectively convert A's to G's. You're really converting A's to I's, but since the I is read as a, like a G, we're going to say it converts the A to a G. And so you can, for example, um, convert um, a U, um, uh, let's see, a U, uh, what would it be, a U, G, A into a UGI, which is equivalent to a UGG, or you could, um, or you could convert um, a UAG, which is another stop codon, into a UIG, which again would be right equivalent to a UGG, and UGG is the codon for tryptophan. So we can actually do sort of the opposite of the last one, which is take away a stop codon and introduce a tryptophan. Um, and then there'll be another stop codon somewhere further on down the mRNA um, so that eventually our protein does stop. But in addition to that, we can also convert, um, convert different amino acids into each other. Um, and if you remember from our amino acid chart where we grouped the amino acids into the nonpolar, the, uh, uh, the, actually they, they sort of, this is small nonpolar and then they call aromatic, which are essentially the large nonpolar. Um, then the basic the polar and the acidic amino acids um, from our chart before, um, uh, we can uh, sometimes convert, for example, uh, um, an isoleucine to a valine, which are very similar to each other, probably not going to have a huge impact on most proteins if that happens. Um, other times we might convert a tyrosine to a cysteine. Um, or, uh, or convert um, a threonine, which is very polar, to an alanine, which is nonpolar. And so that could have a big impact on the way that the protein folds and the way that the protein um, gets organized. Um, and so uh, there are a few sort of very well studied examples of mRNA degradation. And we'll get into this more next time because we're, we're or sorry, not mRNA degradation, of, of mRNA editing. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more next time. But, um, but uh, you know, uh, uh, um, I, I, I used to be, uh, uh, or uh, my, my, my thesis work was actually on, like, um, synapses in the brain and how, and, how, um, neuro, and how neurons in the brain communicate with each other. And there's one very specific, very well-studied example of this where, um, it's, uh, where for reasons that nobody has been able to figure out, um, there, are, there are certain genes where when the mRNA is made, rather than deaminating it in some tissues and not deaminating in other tissues, which kind of makes sense, there are some genes which code for um, proteins that are involved in communication between neurons that always get deaminated. Everywhere you look, they get deaminated. And that deamination has some critical changes in the function of the protein and nobody knows why you don't just put a G in the, new, in the, in the, in the DNA code there. Um, why we haven't at some point evolved a G into the DNA code at, at that point, um, uh, rather than like deaminating every mRNA at this one site. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit next time, as well as talking about um, other aspects in sort of synapt in neurons communication, um, which is one place where this has been very well studied, and it turns out it's very common in the nervous system. Um, and then also talk a little bit about um, something I mentioned a couple weeks ago, which is uh, a paper that received a lot of um, uh, uh, negative attention and, and a lot of people believe is incorrect that claimed that there was way more RNA editing than anyone expected in the human genome. So 